Uh, I'm Stuart Hameroff, the uh, uh, director of the Center for Consciousness Studies. Uh, this is George Mashore, who is uh, the co-chair and uh, co-sponsor from the U University of Michigan Center for Consciousness Science. And it's our uh, pleasure to welcome you all to uh, the, the Science of Consciousness 2022. Uh, those of you in the building who are here in person, welcome. And those of you who are watching and listening uh, online, welcome also. Um, I have uh, some people to thank. We have some people to thank. Um, and there you see it. Uh, the Center for Consciousness Studies here at the University of Arizona the Center for Consciousness Science at the University of Michigan, of which uh, George is the director. I should say that George is, like me, an anesthesiologist, so it's kind of uh, unusual. Many people think that anesthesiologists would be involved in consciousness, but we deal with it on a, on a daily, hourly basis, minute by minute, second by second, actually. And, uh, and, and so anesthesia is a great tool to study it, and we're going to hear some of, some of that uh, this morning. Uh, let me also thank uh, our sponsors, the Eugene Zhang Family Foundation, Google Quantum AI, the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation, Alvin Clark Foundation, anonymous donors, uh, the Bill and Diane Mensch Foundation, Manny Baumick. Next slide, please. Advance it here? Okay. Uh, and special thanks to the conference manager and assistant director, Abby Behar Montefiore. Uh, I think you all realize how uh, fundamentally essential Abby is to this conference. And uh, if you knew behind the scenes, you, you appreciate her even more for what she does. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, our program committee, uh, myself and George, uh, Tom Bevers, Jay Sanguinetti, Bruce McIver, Dante Loretta, Betsy Bigby, and other people who have helped. Um, I want to thank the keynote speakers, the plenary speakers, the concurrent and poster presenters, uh, health tech demo presenters, concurrent chairs, thank you for doing that, uh, artists and entertainers, and most, uh, most importantly, registrants, uh, which uh, uh, keeps us going. Um, we also want to thank Commotion Studios, our superb AV team who's been with us for a while and uh, has, uh, has really been, uh, they've really been fantastic. Um, Edgar Mendoza, our artist, um, who's done, uh, been doing our logos for years. Um, uh, Dean J.P. Jones of the Social and Behavioral, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, University of Arizona. The staff here at Los Ventana Canyon. Uh, Ginny Healy of the University of Arizona Foundation. And our exhibitors, as you can see here, Ant Neuro, Exaptiv, Cosmo Intel, Conscious Matrix, Vibe Me LLC, Conceptualist Films, Relax Saunas, Tennis Centric, Gong Bath, the Academy for the Advancement of Post Materialist Sciences, the Journal of Consciousness Studies, which started the same year as the first conference in 1994, and the Society for Mind Matter Research. So I'd like to introduce George, who'll say a, a few words and then introduce uh, the chair for the first session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. I just want to echo uh, those sentiments and the welcome and the gratitude. I think we have an incredible program this year and it's really starting to strike that um, exquisite balance of having enough methodological rigor to merit the phrase science of consciousness, while also still preserving the exploratory nature uh, that makes Tucson special. And I think this is a, truly a special conference. It, it has a special place in the history of consciousness science, uh, but more than that, it's created a home for so many of us. Um, and I remember my first conference was 25 years ago. It was one of the off cycle ones in Denmark. And it was just so remarkable for me to, to find this home. And I know that many of you who are studying consciousness, seeking, journeying uh, on a pathway also find a home here. And I remember meeting Stuart Hameroff, who was very influential. I never would have dreamed that I would end up being an anesthesiologist studying consciousness like Stuart. 
Um, I also never would have dreamed that I'd end up being as bald as Stuart. Um, but uh, anyway, again, we have a wonderful conference. I welcome you all. I look forward to interacting with you. And I want to now introduce our first moderator, Professor Bruce McIver uh, from Stanford, a brilliant neurophysiologist who will be leading this session. Welcome and thank you to all. Well, we have an exciting uh, lineup this morning. Uh, I like to think of uh, this morning's sessions, not just this plenary, but the subsequent two that will be coming up as addressing the, uh, the hard science question of consciousness as opposed to the hard question, uh, which we still have no clue about. Thankfully, the science is moving forward dramatically. We've got uh, great new tools to study the brain circuits that underlie uh, wakefulness and sleep and loss of consciousness and recovery of consciousness. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, optimistic. I'm really kind of confident, actually, that maybe within my life, we'll shed some interesting insights on the brain circuits and the brain mechanisms that make us uh, lose consciousness at night when we go to sleep, regain it when we wake up in the morning. And uh, from a practical point of view for George and, and Stuart and the anesthesiologists among us, we'll be able to uh, make anesthesia safer and eliminate any possibility of uh, awakening during surgery or any of these undesirable things that, uh, although rare, uh, still do happen. Anyhow, without uh, further ado, um, this session is going to uh, address sleep, wakefulness, and anesthesia. And we're going to start off with uh, uh, Gianno Vannini from the University of Michigan who's going to uh, introduce us to that broad spectrum of sleep, wakefulness, and anesthesia. Yes. Well, while we set up this uh, presentation, uh, thank you very much. Dr. McIver for the introduction, and uh, also thank you to um, Dr. Hammer and Dr. Mashur for the invitation uh, to be part of this event. Um, it's my first time here in Tucson, uh, first time in the Science uh, of Consciousness Conference, and it feels also like the first time I'm presenting in front of an audience uh, because this is my first uh, uh, in-person presentation after probably two years um, so, um, let's see. Um, by the way, uh, I think you can all hear me clearly, but uh, I feel that my voice is unstable at this point. So, especially for those of you in, in the back, if you don't hear me, just wave at me, interrupt, and let me know, and I can do my best to speak a little louder. Um, so... Um, I, I would start by, by thanking uh, and acknowledging um, the, the, the support that made this work possible and uh, the research team, uh, the studies that I will be presenting were funded by uh, NIGMS, uh, the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Anesthesiology. And uh, to the right of the screen, you see a long list of my um, uh, lab members and collaborators, and those names that you see highlighted there are the ones who were directly involved in the, in the work I'm presenting today. Um, quick disclosure, I'm, um, I, I also received uh, funding from uh, TRIP Therapeutics, uh, but I'm not presenting none of that work uh, here today, so there are no conflicts uh, whatsoever. Um, so here's uh, a brief outline of what I will be covering today. Um, first, um, I will show you some evidence uh, indicating that the preoptic area of the hypothalamus is uh, important for sleep generation and for um, the control of sleep homeostasis. 
then during the second third of the, the, the presentation, um, I will present you some um, um, results from a recently published uh, study from my lab in which we demonstrated that the preoptic area is also involved in the regulation of wakefulness. And lastly, I will close by um, um, showing your results from a recently published study also from uh, our group um, in which we investigated uh, the role of preoptic neurons that regulate sleep and wake states in relation to the loss of consciousness produced by general anesthesia. The order might seem a little weird for those of you who know this work very well, but um, it's uh, the most logical uh, order that I <laughs> Um, could bring today for this presentation. Um, so let's start with the first um, point uh, relative to the role of the preoptic area in sleep onset and sleep homeostasis. The idea that uh, the, preoptic, the preoptic area regulates sleep, uh, it's quite old, uh, dates back to the early 1900s when uh, Konstantin von Economo uh, published his uh, observation that, that uh, those patients who had suffered from encephalitis lethargica and subsequently developed uh, severe insomnia symptoms had um, extensive lesions uh, in, the, in the rostral hypothalamus, in the anterior hypothalamus. That observation led uh, von Economo to propose that the anterior hypothalamus was a sleep, the, the sleep center. Um, uh, fortunately, the, 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 this view, which is now outdated, um, um, evolved and uh, the field rapid, rapidly moved from the concept of a sleep center to the current view of a more widely distributed network um, that controls uh, sleep, sleep-wake states in general, but uh, in particular sleep. However, the preoptic area still remains as one of the, 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 the top um, nodes in this network that controls um, sleep. Um, so, so far I have been referring to it as preoptic, which is pretty vague, um, as you can see in that uh, brain schematic. Um, when we zoom in and, and look at the preoptic area has many anatomical subdivisions that um, um, also um, have different um, functional, play different functional roles. So uh, this is important because from the remainder of my presentation, I will refer specifically to the median preoptic nucleus and the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus. And I'm not pointing an, at, <laughs> at, the, at the structures here, but uh, they will be highlighted in subsequent slides. Um, so here's um, um, the, the, the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, which is a bilateral structure deep, deep in the brain, in the anterior hypothalamus. And um, it's uh, indicated by those red circles that you see uh, on that brain schematic, the, the schematic of the, the preoptic area. And um, there has been a lot of research uh, in relation to the, the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, which I may call VLPO for short, um, uh, particularly a subset of uh, cells that um, are identified by the presence of uh, GABA, uh, the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, and the inhibitory neuropeptid uh, galanin. In fact, both are co-expressed in this um, neuronal population and um, evidence uh, indicates that uh, these neurons are mainly active during sleep. Uh, and uh, more recently with the development and use um, in the field um, of newer methodologies that allowed us to, to uh, manipulate, selectively manipulate specific neural subtypes um, um, uh, some, some investigators, some, some uh, well, <laughs> we have been um, able to demonstrate um, that uh, the 
that the GABAergic galaninergic neurons in the preoptic hypothalamus play a causal role in uh, sleep onset. In this case, the, the two figures that I'm uh, showing you there um, uh, are from the same study by Daniel Kroger, and um, they used a couple of different techniques that I'm happy to discuss uh, in detail after my presentation. Uh, but what you need to take away from here is that um, selective stimulation of ventrolateral preoptic gabergic galaninergic neurons increased non-REM sleep. And uh, on the contrary, the inhibition of these uh, same neurons caused uh, 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 a substantial decrease in non-REM sleep and an increase in, in wakefulness. So again, this, is, this uh, study is probably the first um, demonstration that these neurons are causally involved in uh, sleep uh, control. Um, this is a, st a study from, f this is, um, these, these data are from a study from, from my laboratory in which we uh, studied in this case uh, the role of the GABAergic neurons in the median preoptic nucleus, which you also see highlighted uh, or indicated there by the, the red oval. Um, in this case, we used a similar methodological approach and we were able to selectively stimulate GABAergic neurons in the, in, in the median preoptic nucleus and we found that um, when we activated these neurons, uh, it increases non-REM sleep. How do these neurons um, cause sleep onset? Well. Um, both neurons in the median preoptic nucleus and in the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus uh, send uh, inhibitory projections to all major arousal promoting systems. Um, just to name a few, the tuberomamillary nucleus of the hypothalamus, which contains um, histaminergic neurons, the peripheral region of the hypothalamus, which contains um, orexinergic uh, neurons, also known as hypocretins, um, the ventral pontine reticular formation, the parabrachial nucleus, the locus ceruleus, and so forth. So, in other words, um, to induce sleep, these preoptic nucleus shut off the activity of all these major arousal promoting um, areas in the, in, in the brain. So, this evidence briefly summarizes uh, the role of these neurons in uh, sleep onset, uh, but these preoptic nucleus are, neurons are also involved in the regulation of sleep homeostasis. And we know that because of several lines of evidence. First, uh, preoptic neurons increase their activity or discharge rates uh, as a function of time awake, for example, uh, during uh, sleep deprivation. Um, and also, increase their activity in direct correlation with electroencephalographic markers of sleep uh, propensity, of increased sleep propensity. Second, um, adenosine, which is a sleep-promoting neuromodulator, which uh, accumulates uh, in the brain, in, in several brain regions um, uh, during wakefulness. Um, this neur neuromodulator uh, activates sleep-promoting preoptic neurons. Um, when uh, adenosine receptors are blocked within the preoptic um, area, and this is done by pharmacology, by, um, for example, uh, injecting an, uh, an antagonist for those receptors into the preoptic area, um, that uh, blocks the increase in the activity of these preoptic sleep-promoting neurons uh, that occurs uh, during sleep deprivation. Lastly, um, there's a very recent study from well, last year um, in which um, they used a genetic deletion of uh, galaninergic neurons and they demonstrated that um, when they eliminated these neurons there was a reduced um, sleep homeostatic response after sleep deprivation. Um, so taking all this uh, together we can conclude that yes the preoptic area is um, very important for sleep onset for the regulation of sleep onset um, and probably for maintaining sleep and also for uh, regulating sleep homeostasis.
So I will now move to the um, second um, part of the, the talk, um, showing you some, some of our recent results um, from a study in which we demonstrate that um, pre uh, the, the preoptic area also contains neurons that um, uh, promote wakefulness. And well, who cares about this? Um, Keep in mind that for many, many years, until not too long ago, uh, the entire sleep field had, have considered, has considered um, the preoptic area as um, exclusively somnogenic. Um, so um, there was some prior evidence suggesting that uh, preoptic neurons could also promote wakefulness. And these are studies from, for example, a couple of um, single cell recording um, studies um, showing that the majority of the neurons in the preoptic region uh, are active during non-REM sleep uh, and to a less, uh, lesser degree uh, during REM sleep. Um, and there's still a subset of neurons that uh, was neglected until now um, that uh, is active during wakefulness. Um, there's also a recent study using modeling simula simulation using uh, EEG dynamics from uh, rats whose preoptic area had been lesioned. And uh, that study by Cliff Saper and uh, his colleagues uh, proposed that the preoptic area uh, plays a dual role in the, in the control of sleep and wakefulness, can either uh, pr uh, control sleep and also uh, wakefulness, and um, there are a couple more, uh, more studies. There were a couple uh, more studies uh, before we started. Uh, one um, by Chung uh, and colleagues, um, in which they targeted specifically preoptic neurons that project to the tuberomammillary tubero nucleus of the hypothalamus. Um, just as a reminder, I mentioned uh, this nucleus is a, uh, an important arousal promoting system. Uh, this is the the um, the nucleus that contains neurons that use histamine as um, a wake-promoting neurotransmitter. Uh, and they found that stimulation of these neurons um, also produces wakefulness. Um, next, um, we also uh, were in the middle of conducting a study and uh, we were surprised by the finding that stimulation of preoptic glutamatergic neurons that I will describe uh, later on um, also increase wakefulness. So with all that in mind, uh, we decided to um, further uh, characterize those, those neurons. Um, you can see um, another study listed down there, and it's not by mistake that um, there's a gap between this, uh, the, 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 the first four and this one. The, 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 the last study listed there um, demonstrated that TAC1 neurons within the preoptic area um, also promote wakefulness. This study was published probably two, three months uh, before the one I'm about to show you and um, came from, from UPenn and actually Alex uh, was a co-author. Um, uh, and um, I'll get back to this, uh, this uh, study in, in, in a few minutes. So uh, this is the paper that uh, we published. Uh, the study was published in uh, Jane or Science last year, and um, uh, was, uh, the work was led by a postdoc in my laboratory, Dr. Alejandra Mondino, um, uh, who did, um, who used um, uh, a viral vector approach for uh, selectively expressing designer receptors, modified receptors in genetically targeted neurons, in this case glutamatergic, so that then we can manipulate at will. In this case, the manipulation consists in um, oh, <laughs> an injection of um, the agonist um, that will then bind to those receptors and activate uh, those neurons. Um, the image on top, uh, shows um, in red the area of receptor expression in a, in a, in a brain section, and the schematic below it uh, shows in uh, yellow the extension of the receptor expression that uh, thank you, um, uh, that includes the 
VLPO, the ventrolateral preoptic uh, nucleus, and the more uh, the, the most uh, dorsal portion, ventral portion of the medial and lateral preoptic as well. So. What we found was that uh, stimulation of um, these preoptic glutamatergic neurons caused a transient increase in, in wakefulness, a reduction in non-REM sleep, and um, a reduction, a substantial re reduction uh, of REM sleep. And this was probably the most uh, salient um, effect that we observed. Um, and in fact, um, there was uh, total sleep, uh, REM sleep suppression in up to 80% of the mice used in this, in this uh, study. So there's some interesting mechanistic, uh, me mechanism going on at the circuit level that we're starting to explore uh, in, in, in a new study. Um, we also found that uh, activation of these glutamatergic neurons produces uh, state instability and sleep fragmentation. And, um, there on the screen, you can see uh, this uh, schematic. Um, we conducted a probabilistic um, analysis, and what we showed was that um, when we activated these neurons, which is in this uh, schematic is represented by the, the blue arrows, um, the, there was a reduction of the probability of uh, the animal remaining in non-REM sleep as well as uh, an increase in the probability of transitioning from non-REM sleep to wakefulness. And this happened uh, many times back and forth during the, the recording period, uh, causing that sleep fragmentation that I was mentioning. Um, and let's see, um, if you look at those um, two traces, the, the hypnograms, um, uh, well, it's hard to, let's see if I, Um, I will never be able to point that out. Um, but um, um, in the hypnograms that plot the, 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 the transitions from wakefulness to non-REM sleep to REM sleep uh, after vehicle injection and CNO, which is the, the, the agonist that activated these receptors, uh, you, you can see how um, in the CNO condition there's uh, a constant uh, fluctuation between states, particularly non-REM and, and, and wakefulness, that uh, explains that fragmentation um, that, that I mentioned or, um, a moment ago. So um, another important finding was that uh, when we activated these neurons, uh, we found that uh, there was a significant decrease in the power um, in slow oscillations. Um, there was also an increase, an increase in cortical connectivity and uh, an increase in uh, complexity. Um, altogether indicates um, that the activation of these neurons shifts um, cortical dynamics towards uh, a more activated brain state. And um, note that this is um, only referring to non-REM sleep, which we interpreted as uh, um, uh, um, a lighter REM sleep that results from the activation of these neurons. Um, we are in the process of uh, mapping the projections to identify the re relevant brain sites. Uh, by which these neurons promote wakefulness and cause sleep fragmentation and REM sleep suppression. Uh, we are using a um, viral vector approach uh, to identify those terminals in specific brain regions. And um, there you, you, you see just a, a, a few examples, but so far we, we are seeing that these glutamatergic neurons project to all the known uh, arousal promoting uh, systems in the brain as well as uh, to areas that are, are important for thermal regulation, such as the dorsal medial hypothalamus and the raphe pallidus. And I, I mentioned this, I, I didn't show any, any, any of those results, but um, um, in addition to all the changes that I described so far, uh, we also found that when these neurons were activated, uh, there was a, um, uh, it, it also pr uh, produced a, a reduction um, in, in body temperature. So to recap what I've shown you so far uh, in relation to these neurons, we found that um, when activated, these glutamatergic neurons in the medial lateral preoptic region promote wakefulness. They cause state instability and uh, 
a marked uh, sleep fragmentation. Um, they suppress REM sleep, they produce cortical activation, and um, anatomical studies indicate that um, uh, they do so um, by, by um, direct excitatory projections to um, the main arousal promoting systems in, in the brain. So, um, I have still eight minutes, so I will uh, close by uh, discussing the results from um, uh, one of the, the recent studies from our group showing that um, preoptic pre neurons uh, that regulate sleep and wake states. Um, let me rephrase that. Uh, <laughs> the study in, uh, uh, that we conducted to investigate whether um, preoptic neurons that regulate sleep and wake states um, um, uh, contribute to um, the loss of consciousness produced by general anesthesia. And there's no better introduction than showing this depiction of the first public successful demonstration of uh, the use of a general anesthetic, in this case ether, um, and this event um, happened in back in uh, 1846 at uh, MGH. And uh, despite the uh, continued clinical use of uh, anesthetic drugs um, for over 170 years, um, the mechanisms by which these drugs uh, suppress consciousness uh, remains at least unclear or incompletely understood. Um, one of the main hypothesis um, is that uh, is the shared circuit hypothesis that proposes that uh, general anesthetics hijack sleep centers to produce unconsciousness. Um, this hypothesis um, has been tested and supported by abundant um, uh, evidence, mostly from correlational studies. And one of the most um, beautiful studies, in my opinion, uh, is uh, the work by Jason Moore um, at UPenn working with uh, Max Kells. And um, I'm just going to mention this, but it's, uh, there's a lot more in that, in, in that study. Um, so uh, what they found what, was that uh, the general anesthetic isofluorine directly activates preoptic neurons. I'll repeat that. Um, the general anesthetic isofluorine at doses that cause unconsciousness cause a, causes a direct activation of these preoptic neurons that uh, were very well characterized by, by Jason and colleagues. Uh, and in this case, um, are presumably sleep promoting. How do we know that? Well, in this case, um, you see the, the red trace under the, the, the recording of this, uh, um, this intracellular recording um, that indicates uh, that, um, the, uh, that they applied the wakefulness promoting neurotransmitter noradrenaline to the bath solution. And they found that uh, these neurons are inhibited by noradrenaline. They also found that these neurons, um, and I hope you can see that very well there, and that's indicated by the blue traces, are um, activated when they are exposed to isofluorine. Um, this is uh, specific to these neurons that, again, are presumably sleep promoting, and um, um, they found uh, different um, uh, several other uh, subgroups of neurons within the preoptic area that responded in a totally different way to noradrenaline, and uh, they did not, they, they were not inhibited by, or actually activated by, by isofluorine. So this is specific to a subset of neurons in this area. Um, so I just wanted to highlight uh, this study, which is one of many that supports the shared circuit hypothesis, but again, um, this, uh, most of these uh, studies uh, were correlational in nature. So with that in mind, we launched um, our own study, 
um, focusing on the role of GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons within the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. We knew that these uh, neurons play a role in sleep, um, in the modulation of sleep-wake ar architecture, and we wanted uh, to ask whether activation of sleep-promoting neurons in the median preoptic and ventrolateral preoptic area would uh, modulate sleep-wake states and alter anesthetic sensitivity. Um, so first off, we um, stimulated, uh, selectively stimulated GABAergic neurons in the median preoptic nucleus, and we found that um, they increased non-REM sleep. We also did the same for glutamatergic neurons, with, uh, which uh, did not cause a compelling change in sleep-wake architecture. Um, so based on this evidence, this finding, um, that GABAergic neurons increased uh, non-REM sleep, um, we predicted that activation of sleep-promoting neurons prior to anesthesia would increase the sensitivity to um, the general anesthetic. Um, so the experimental design was uh, straightforward. Uh, we uh, prepared uh, animals um, that expressed designer receptors for activation of GABAergic or glutamatergic neurons in the median preoptic nucleus. Uh, we injected the agonist, waited long enough for uh, the agonist to start uh, acting, um, and we transferred the animals to a sealed chamber where, where they were exposed to a surgical concentration of isoflurane. We quantified the, um, the, the, the time uh, required for induction and the recovery time from uh, general anesthesia. Um, and what we found, to our surprise, was that there was no effect whatsoever. Um, we tested GABAergic neurons, glutamatergic neurons, uh, different doses of the, 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 the receptor agonist, and we even used uh, a lower concentration of isoflurane um, with the idea of maybe by reducing the concentration um, towards a more sedative um, dose would unmask um, the potential effect of these neurons. Well, as you can see there, um, these neurons did not alter anesthetic state transitions. Um, so then we moved to the, the VLPO where we stimulated both GABAergic and glutamatergic, glutamatergic neurons, and the main finding was that uh, glutamatergic neurons um, caused a, a, an important increase in wakefulness and uh, a reduction in sleep. With that evidence in mind, we predicted that activation of selective activation of these glutamatergic neurons, which are wakefulness promoting, prior to anesthesia would reduce the sensitivity to general anesthesia. And um, again, the same approach, and we found no effect. This was shocking, really. Um, so we, we um, tested both GABAergic glutamatergic neurons within the, the ventrolateral preoptic, and we used two different concentrations of uh, isoflurane, and there was no change in anesthetic state transitions. So what we can take away from, um, these, uh, from this study was that, one, we demonstrated that activation of GABAergic um, neurons in the median preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus increased non-REM non sleep. And yes, there has been a lot of investigations uh, in relation to these neurons, but this was the first causal demonstration, a causal investigation um, relative to, to the role uh, um, um, on, 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 on sleep control. Second, we found that activation of glutamatergic neurons in the ventrolateral preoptic area increased wakefulness. And as I mentioned before, this is very important because um, traditionally the sleep field had considered the preoptic area as uh, an exclusively somnogenic region, and this was um, one of the first um, empirical demonstrations uh, that uh, these glutamatergic neurons play a causal role in the regulation of wakefulness. Uh, third, um, activating these same neurons had no effect on the entry to or emergence from um, general anesthesia with isoflurane. Uh, so, so we concluded uh, that uh, first, preoptic neurons controlling sleep-wake states do not necessarily mediate general anesthesia. 
and uh, current evidence, which is correlative, um, uh, in favor of a mechanistic overlap of sleep and anesthesia might not have a strong causal significance. With that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to get any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Vanini. Uh, that was a, a beautiful presentation of hard science, which uh, I love. Uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Vanini didn't point out is uh, just how cool the techniques he's using are. He's able to selectively target subgroups of neurons all mixed together in the same uh, region of the brain, which we could never do before uh, the development of these uh, chemogenetic and optogenetic uh, tools, which uh, I alluded to earlier. We're going to hold off on questions due to the large size of the audience and the fact that we'll have all the speakers uh, on the stage together um, after the, the final talk. And so if you could just jot down any questions you, you have uh, for Dr. Vanini at this point, and uh, we'll get back to them um, at the end. Our next speaker is Professor Larkham, who's uh, joining us from uh, Humboldt University in Germany. Um, I'm not sure, is he here or is he coming remotely? Remotely it is. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Larkham, the stage is yours. Great. So can you can see my screen? I assume you can hear me then. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to put forward a, a, a theory that we've been building on now for, for some years um, and try to link it to, uh, to some recent results on what we think anesthesia might be doing. Um, and and I, I hope I can link it all in in a way that, that, that makes sense. So um, luckily for me, Giancarlo already introduced the fact that um, we've, we've had anesthesia now for a long, long time, 160 years or more, and, uh, and we still don't know why it works, which is really an amazing fact, I think, given that it's one of the first findings of neuroscience overall. Um, and I think one of the paradoxes of anesthesia is, is not only that it really selectively blocks consciousness, but it, it leaves brain activity largely intact, which, um, which means that I think we're looking for some really specific mechanism. A lot of people have made this claim, and, uh, and of course, there's been many suggestions over the years. Um, so obviously, um, the link between anesthesia and the loss of consciousness and consciousness itself um, must have, there must be some relationship here and I guess that we're all at the moment um, uh, fumbling around to try to explain this. Well, I, 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 uh, I'm a scientist that comes from a, a very bottom-up tradition. Um, I, I did a postdoc in, in a laboratory in Germany with Bert Sackmann patching dendrites of, of neurons um, and really it's been a, a long journey to, to come to this point. Um, so I'm really interested in how the, the components actually operate. Um, and I hope for, for you as an audience, because I presume there's people from all sorts of backgrounds here, um, that, that this is a, an, an insight into, into what, what can be gained by actually trying to work out how the components operate. Um, so one thing we do know about uh, anesthesia and, and when, when you lose consciousness is that it's, it's aligned with a, a huge loss of feedback connectivity, and this has been shown by many researchers, including George Mashur, who introduced this session. Um, and, and on the other hand, if you look at when, when consciousness does occur, and, and, and now I'm alluding to um, EEG recordings that are done uh, now, have been done routinely for over half a century, um, 
first of all, if you're if you're looking at uh, the test of of let's say consciousness from the point of view of of um, the the moment of consciousness when you do a a, a test from with with very very hard to detect um, stimuli, what you can see from the EEG perspective is that um, first of all, if you if you do a a, a subliminal um, stimuli stimulus, you still get a response in the cortex. Um, and but the difference between when a person reports that they they actually feel this um, is not in this first volley, the 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 volley that's thought to be um, let's say the sensory volley coming through the thalamus and uh, and uh, relayed to the cortex, but in some subsequent and 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 then more um, subsequent waves that come after the first volley. And this is a, a now a long um, established um, established finding, and it it's, it doesn't correlate so well necessarily to the effect that the first volley has on the on the cortex there's something very special about this second and then subsequent waves and this correlates to what Stuart Hameroff might have uh, uh, described as the being of consciousness something happens um, that that is register re that you can register with the EEG but we still don't really understand so um, research is looking at this kind of phenomenon in in monkeys uh, now, still three decades ago, and now using extracellular recordings in the depth of the of the cortex, so looking at all the different layers, um, could already work out that uh, again they see the same effect in in a monkey that that the second wave is somehow correlated with with the perception of the animal, um, and and they they could see from the from the the current source density analysis of the of the extracellular recordings at different depths, that there was something, first of all, in the first volley that was associated with a, with a, a current sync, probably um, input to neurons in the middle layers of the cortex and the deep layers of the cortex, but that this second, uh, presumably feedback volley comes to the upper layers of the cortex. Now, I'm gonna to try to convince you um, in this talk that this has something to do with the dendrites of the pyramidal neurons. and and. Uh, I think as, as has been um, remarked many times before, it should have something to do with the pyramidal neurons per se, because that's where we should expect the dipoles that, that uh, create the, the EG response that you can record. Um, but I'm gonna uh, allude to something more specific than just act activation of these neurons. And in particular, I'm gonna try to convince you that it's got something to do with the intrinsic properties of these neurons. So what do I mean by that? I want to focus on the, the apical dendrites of the big layer five neurons. So if you would look in a cross section of a, at least here in a rodent cortex, but actually in any um, in any neocortex, and here you can see uh, um, pyramidal neurons um, in in a in a uh, coronal section of a of a rodent that are expressing um, an optogenetic marker, so you can see them very well. Well, these pyramidal neurons, uh, we, we know from the architecture of the cortex are going to be receiving a, a, a predominantly feedback in the upper uh, regions of the cortex, very much in coming in through layer one, and the feed forward from the pyramidal cell perspective are coming um, towards the bottom of these neurons. So if you see the neuron as having two compartments, you can, you can see that the the feed forward is affecting the bottom compartment and the feedback predominantly the top compartment. Well, for a long time, we've been studying these neurons, trying to work out what the properties of their dendrites are and how they should react to, to input coming to these different regions. And if input comes to the bottom of the neuron, you can go over to my laser point here. The, if, if you record from the bottom compartment and you inject current into the bottom compartment, you get this familiar um, train of action potentials. If you can record from the upper compartment, which we were doing um, some time ago, uh, you can see a reflection of the action potentials at the cell body that are propagating back into the dendrite. But now the remarkable thing is if you turn this around and inject current into the distal dendrite, into the upper compartment that normally is receiving feedback, you get a completely re different response of the neurons. Um, and this we would call a calcium spike. And it, it's, it's a plateau potential um, and it not only really uh, um, is an incredible feature of what the dendrites can do, but completely changes the output of the neuron. And 
I, I, uh, I'm not sure how many people in the audience uh, are actually aware that, that this occurs, but it's very, very uh, robust and routine for layer five neurons. Um, so if I was there in person now, I'd ask for a show of hands to see what, how, how, um, how much that penetrates, if you like, the, the, the neuroscience community as a, as a phenomenon. But this, this can be more or less robustly um, achieved from, from any, any pyramidal neuron you try. Now, um, when we turn to what this means for the EEG, that means that there's, there's, a, there's a whole amount of, of current that flows in, not just from the synapses here, but also through the, the, the it turns out, um, high voltage activated, long lasting um, calcium channels here in the upper part of the apical dendrite. And, and now the textbooks would claim that when you see EEGs, it's due to the dipole that forms around the, the pyramidal neurons, mainly from current coming through um, the, the receptors activated by, by the transmitter. But there's no reason why the opening of calcium channels shouldn't have this effect. And that's something we looked into. So, so basically, we, we want, we're looking at this, this EEG response and asking, is, there, is it possible that that has anything to do with the activation of the dendrites? So, pyramidal neurons. So we did this in rodents, and we, we repeated the experiments that were done in the monkeys um, by putting, uh, again, a, a, an array of um, electrodes, um, so a Michigan probe in the depth of the cortex, and we stimulated um, the limb of the, the hind limb of the, of the rodent. And to just cut a long story short, uh, we, we saw two cases, basically. One was um, uh, uh, this, this pattern that, that, uh, that's showing a, a activation in the deep layers of the cortex followed by something in the apical dendrite. And another one that occurred um, just as often that was a sink, a late sink in the, in the upper layers. And this we could see from where it was starting was being generated just where we would expect a, a calcium um, spike in the dendrite. So we looked at that further. One way to do this was to, um, was to fill these neurons with with a, um, a calcium indicator and to record with a, with a microprobe from the dendrites only to see whether or not that corresponded to calcium in the dendrites. And sure enough, the, this, this late um, sink here corresponds, when, it, when, when you see it, corresponds exactly to calcium in the dendrites. And another way to probe this was to block calcium in the dendrites using, in this case, baclofen. I won't go into why we expect baclofen to block calcium spikes right now, just for, for uh, time reasons, but I'm happy to go into that, or you could read this paper to, to uh, satisfy yourself that that is a nice way to selectively block um, calcium spikes in this case. But the upshot is that if, you, if you're blocking the calcium spikes um, while you stimulate the hind limb and, when, and, you, and you look at the times when you're having a two component response, then the first component um, is not blocked by blocking calcium in the calcium channels in the dendrites. And we think, therefore, that's, that's the EPSP that, that is typically referred to in, in textbooks. But this second component is, is more than likely than the, the calcium spike that's in the dendrites. And that, that, that it, it's, what this basically tells you is that you can get a signal that's more or less the same size from a, calcium, from a population calcium spike uh, as you can from EPSP. So that, that makes us feel that maybe this is really the calcium spike. And we went on and looked at this in, in, in many guises. And so one way was to repeat this um, perceptual threshold experiment, that is to go through different stimulus intensities from subliminal to liminal or to, to um, perce uh, perceptible. And to basically with the hypothesis that at the subliminal values, you, you would not activate the dendrites and at the uh, superliminal um, values, it would activate the dendrites. In other words, the feedback will come back to these neurons and activate a, a calcium spike. So to do this, we took uh, um, rodents. We, we uh, used transgenic animals where we could express um, GCAMP, which is a, um, a, a genetic indicator for calcium. And, and so it's expressing only in the pyramidal cells of this of this rodent. And, and then we can use two photon imaging to take a plane just where the calcium spike would be generated. And you can see these dots here represent lots of different dendrites or different pyramidal neurons, just where you might expect to see a calcium spike. And we can uh, basically using two photon imaging and, and 
choosing the stimulus intensity to be just that point where the animals 50% don't react and 50% do react, which is basically the definition of the moment of perception, if you like. So this is where, uh, where we, one imagines that half the time they're actually perceiving the stimulus. We can ask, do you see calcium in the dendrites? And well, to cut a long story short, uh, you can find a, a subpopulation of neurons um, where the calcium in the dendrites uh, is really strong and correlates to, to when the animal leaked or hit and when you can presume that the animal perceived the stimulus and, uh, and, and half the time they don't. Maybe I should say that it takes, this is after about a week or two of preparing the animal with very high stimulus, um, uh, in, uh, high intensity stimuli where, where the animal knows very well what to do um, when in this case the whisker is is stimulated uh, and then for after you've trained the animal like this you take the 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 halfway point uh, in the psychometric curve and and you look to see what ha is happening with calcium at that point so um, that that shows that there's a correlation between what's going on in the dendrites and the apparent perception of the animal but then we could go further and start manipulating the calcium in the dendrites and and here if you if you if you start suppressing calcium and calcium spikes in the dendrites, you can shift the psychometric curve to the right, which means basically that uh, it's that the perception is getting more difficult for the animal. Um, and if you, perhaps amazingly, putting retinoidopsin in the in the same pyramidal neurons, um, you can shift the curve in the other direction. This means that if you activate the dendrites while you're stimulating the whisker at, at different intensities. Um, it can start to perceive this at lower and lower intensities, and even at a zero intensity, which uh, is about 40% response rate at, at um, when you didn't stimulate at all, um, which, um, which tends to uh, suggest that these animals are hallucinating at that point, the, the, the stimulus. But in any case, I think what this establishes is there's some kind of causal relationship between what happens in the dendrites of these uh, pyramidal neurons and the perception of the of the animal. We went a bit further with that because um, now you can you can really choose um, different subpopulations of these pyramidal neurons, and there are known to be um, subcortically projecting pyramidal neurons, often called pyramidal tract neurons or PT neurons, and they're cortical cortical projecting pyramidal neurons. Um, so intertelencephalic uh, pyramidal neurons that also go to the striatum, by the way. But in any case, they're mostly uh, corticocortical neurons. And you, we could ask using, an, um, in this case, a chemogenetic approach, uh, which of the targets of these different neurons um, were responsible for, for um, the, the perception of the animal? And indeed, which of these subpopulations were most responsible? Well, the first thing we found was that the, it's the pyramidal tract neurons, so the subcortically projecting neurons that, uh, that are important, at least in this task, for, for the perception of the animal. And then of all of the different targets, the most important downstream target was the higher order thalamic regions that were being targeted by these neurons. Actually, also the superior colliculus and striatum, but mostly the, the uh, higher order um, uh, th th thalamus, which in the rodent somatosensory system is the posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus. Um, and, and interestingly enough, it didn't matter uh, whether you suppressed the, the brainstem regions that were also projection targets of pyramidal tract neurons uh, for, the, for the behavior of the animal. So, so we take from that that there's something important about pyramidal tract neurons, about the activation of their dendrites, and about the, the, the effect that that has in their activation of, of higher order regions of the, of the thalamus. Okay, so getting back to anesthesia um, and, and, uh, and what we might expect. So just, uh, I'll just highlight again the, the fact that we, we know that there's a huge loss of of feedback that's occurring during anesthesia. As to say, and this is a, um, another result from George Mashua showing with various different um, anesthetics. Um, and, and here, by, they're not just different, but they have really different actions, if you like, or, or, or sites of, um, of, 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 of where they, where they, what is thought that they're actually 
um, doing it at the molecular level. And nevertheless, there's, uh, when this, in, during this blue bar, you can see uh, for feedback activity, there's a huge decline and for feed forward activity, there's, there's no effect. And, and uh, so we wanted to, if, to get some hold on what that actually meant. And now we can actually achieve this with, with, uh, in rodents with transgenic animals. Essentially, we can um, express now in specifically in the pyramidal tract neurons a uh, channel rhodopsin. And, and this, we can finally do the, the experiment of our dreams, which is to put blue light, which activates now the, the, the channel rhodopsin, only on the dendrites. We do this by inserting a microprism uh, that, that basically is a mirror pointing at 90 degrees. And so we can shine light horizontally in the cortex. And we can, we can basically play God as though we have feedback to these pyramidal neurons. And when we do that in an awake animal, we get what we expected actually from what I showed you earlier, which is that you activate these dendrites, you get burst firing from the cell bodies. And here we, we're registering that by recording with um, so-called juxtacellular recordings at the cell bodies of these neurons. And you can see here, uh, play that again. Um, lots of repeats of, of trials where we stimulate the dendrites and you can see the response. So, but what's perhaps shocking is that when you anesthetize the animal, it flatlines. And the reason why I find this so shocking is that th this is now not a circuit phenomenon because we're recording directly from a single uh, neuron, a single pyramidal neuron, and we're just activating the dendrites. So this is a biophysical uh, mechanism. That's to say, we are depolarizing this dendrite uh, because the blue light opens channel rhodopsin channels in, in the tufts of these, of these neurons, but it's somehow not influencing the cell body. Um, and, and so that was shocking to me at least because I, I really couldn't believe that, that, that you would get a, a flat line response from, from this. And it basically means that uh, the anesthesia is decoupling these neurons in the sense that it's it's preventing signals that are coming to the top that would normally be feedback information to these neurons from affecting the output of this neuron and maybe uh, uh, um, might need to add there if you if you didn't know that the axon comes from the bottom of the neuron so this actually basically blocks the output of the neuron if to this to the extent that the output is influenced by feedback coming to the top of the of the neuron. And so you can imagine that if this is happening in some sort of ubiquitous sense across the cortex, you're basically decoupling feedback across the cortex by this mechanism. And as far as I can see, uh, you just have to conclude from this, from the, the biophysics here, that that is going to be the result of, of anesthesia. Um, so what, well, another thing we could do in this study was to record at different depths. And here we, we moved up to a glass electrode at different depths because uh, we got a photoelectric effect on the, on, the, um, on the Michigan probe, which is just a detail. Um, but in essence, we could record from different depths. And you can see in the awake animal, uh, although it's somehow complex, the extracellular response, you can see that there's a, there's a but this, this is now, there's the effect of depolarizing the tough dendrites of, pyramidal neurons is going down throughout the, the cortex. By the way, this is a good um, demonstration that the, the, the dipoles that you get um, are being created by the pyramidal neurons because it's only the pyramidal neurons that can respond here because it's only the pyramidal neurons that have uh, channel rhodopsin in their dendrites. But under anesthesia, you get the same response in the dendrites, which is expected because that's, uh, that's where we're depolarizing, but it just doesn't reach the, the bottom of the neuron. So there's some sort of coupling zone um, about uh, around about layer four or layer, upper layer five, where the signals don't pass through, and and this has got something to do with with anesthesia. So uh, going back to to this situation and, and trying to get at this coupling zone, one thing we we well also knew and could establish in this study or repeat if you like in this study was that. Um, was that the thalamus is down regulated by anesthesia. So you can just put a, um, a recording electrode in, in high, higher order thalamus regions, in this case, the posterior medial nucleus, and see that uh, it, during the anesthetic, there's far less firing in that region of the thalamus. Um, we could also do that deliberately. So um, just, just as a, a revision, there's, there's two, two general classes of thalamic regions, it's core thalamic regions and, and, and and higher order or matrix projection regions, and they have different targets in the in the cortex. So the core thalamus targets layer four, and, and in the in the whisker 
uh, system of a rodent. These are actually forming what are called barrels, or that's why it's often referred to as the barrel cortex. Um, whereas the higher order uh, projections go very much to layer one, but also to layer 5A. So it's basically missing layer four and, and going to either end of the, of the um, pyramidal neuron. This would be just above the cell body um, of, of a layer five neuron. So focusing on that, one thing we could do was in this study was to um, inhibit or downregulate the activity of the posterior medial nucleus, the higher order thalamic nucleus that has this kind of projection. So that means we took an awake animal and suppressed the thalamus. And in that case, um, I hope I'm not going too fast. The red here is the typical fast response that's indicating a population um, bursting response of, of uh, cells in the, in, in the cortex now. This is pyramidal neural um, cell responses recording from this bottom compartment while we depolarize the dendrites at the top. So it's the same old experiment um, and, and this is basically a summary of what I was just saying in the awake state, when we suppress the higher order thalamus, you can see a, a huge decrease in the coupling because the response in the dendrite is unchanged, but there's far less uh, response at the, at the cell bodies. Um, and one of the things we knew from various different um, uh, um, studies, and, but in particular the studies of Murray Sherman, is that a large fraction of the inputs from higher order thalamus back to the cortex work through so-called metabotropic glutamate receptors. So we could target those receptors um, specifically. And, and there, uh, that meant that we were basically putting in antagonists for metabotropic glutamate receptors, which is the target, if you like, of the higher order thalamus. And in this case, you, you can see again, it flatlined. So this is, just to reiterate, this is an awake animal in which we're recording the, the population response in, the, in, the, in layer five. We are activating the dendrites and suppressing the, the metabotropic glutamate receptors. And, and here you can see there's, there's no information getting from the top to the bottom if you don't have activated metabotropic glutamate receptors, which we would normally expect to be activated by the, the uh, higher order thalamus. Okay, so what I'm proposing is that this reconciles the two views on consciousness. Um, in, in essence, what I'm referring to is that we, there are those people that put an emphasis on, on the corticocortical projections, and in particular, the top-down projections from frontal cortex to, to the back of the brain and to sensory cortex. And then there's been a lot of emphasis on, on the thalamocortical loop um, that, uh, that is also apparently important. And we were just hearing in, in the previous lecture. Um, so for instance, I think uh, um, there's, 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 there was even, um, some reference, I think yesterday in, in, in one of the workshops to the fact that if you suppress the thalamus, then you suppress consciousness. And on the other hand, if you, if you, if you activate thalamus in an anesthetized animal, you can sometimes re, reawake uh, animals. And, but the same is true of, of the frontal cortex. I'm, I'm thinking of some of George Mashur's data, which shows that activation uh, through cholinergic um, act, uh, receptor activation in the prefrontal cortex can can also wake up an animal, and that, that seems to be um, a, a dichotomy there. And this, there's an argument as to, you know, what which of these should be the uh, should be telling us more about what's going on in consciousness. So what I'd like to propose is that basically everyone's right. What's going on is that there's a there's a, a, a weak link, if you like, or a bottleneck where information flows. Um, throughout the cortex. So when you have feedback information, it needs to get through this bottleneck. And this bottleneck is maintained by the thalamocortical loop. So some, there's something important about having that thalamocortical loop for conscious perception. Uh, and it seems to be maintaining, at a minimum, it's maintaining the, this link from the top to the bottom of the neurons. And this is what, um, this essentially, if you, if you lose this link, and particularly if you lose this link ubiquitously across the cortex, then you basically cut out all feedback information. And, and so we're proposing essentially that the mechanism for anesthesia is anything that comes in the end to, to deactivate or suppress this link or to decouple these neurons. And, and in, in basically that's why there can be 
uh, essentially a, 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 a some mechanism where where you can suddenly lose consciousness very um, in a very binary way, but nevertheless, the apparently the activity states of the neurons are the same. By which I mean, if you record from the the bottom of the neuron, which is what basically everybody in neuroscience does. I mean, everybody, most people are reporting what's happening in terms of the activation of the cell bodies of neurons. But, but essentially, this is unchanged. It, what what is changed is the link between the top and the bottom of the neurons. And so it's, it's not surprising that feed forward activity remains intact in, in this condition. But it's not, and on the other hand, it's not surprising that you get such a ubiquitous and binary effect on on uh, on consciousness if it's so dependent on 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 feedback and i think this fits with various different kinds of uh, certainly the two um, leading theories if you like of of consciousness at the moment uh, integrated information theory and the global neuronal workspace theory both of these theories depend on in some sense global signaling and the effect of um, of feed forward and feedback interactions across the brain i think it's clear that if you would sever the the ubiquitously the, the the cortical neurons you would have an effect on both according to both of these theories you would have an effect on on consciousness and we're calling this dendritic integration theory to highlight the fact that really you need to you need to start treating the neurons as more complex than just point neurons and start to look specifically at their apical dendrites and the mechanisms in their apical dendrites to to understand why this would be the case Okay, so uh, I, I guess I'll finish there. I'd like to give a big shout out to um, some really fantastic uh, postdocs in my lab, Morotaka Suzuki, who did uh, all the um, all the work I showed to do with anesthesia and the EGs and so on, and um, and Jan Aru, who came in then later in the in the uh, in the project and talked a lot about the relationship to consciousness, and then Aya Takahashi, um, who who did a lot of the perceptual uh, detection experiments and uh, the two photon imaging in Dendrisk. And thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Larkin, for that exquisitely detailed view of, uh, first of all, perceptual experience and how it's critically dependent on dendritic somatic integration and for providing a very uh, plausible um, uh, site for uh, pretty much all the anesthetics. Certainly ketamine is a NMDA receptor blocker and would uncouple uh, the dendritic and somal compartments. But we know these dendrites are chocked full of GABA receptors as well. So drugs like propofol and barbiturates that um, also produce anesthesia uh, will shunt the signals from the upper dendrite down to the cell body region. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, beautiful. And it also accounts for why do we see these delays in cortex between a stimulus and perception. I mean, we're looking at uh, 40 to 60 millisecond long delays between the stimulus and the, uh, Stuart would call it the Bing moment, and it's because you've got to get feedback from multiple regions of the brain before you're consciously aware of these uh, stimuli. Anyhow, um, that was a, a beautiful uh, presentation and uh, we're going to move on now to uh, uh, Professor uh, Prokyat from Pennsylvania who will uh, finish off our panel and then we'll go to uh, questions and answers. Alex? Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Is my mic working? Okay, good. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's my great honor to be here. I can't believe I've never been to this meeting before, so it's a real honor to be invited. Um, and I'll tell you about our thinking about general anesthetics. And I think, as you will see, this is very consistent and interrelated with the view that Dr. Larkham just expressed. Uh, the only difference is going to be that I'm going to try to talk about sort of collections of neurons rather than
asking about uh, specific neurons or their compartments. Of course, it is not really possible to talk about how anesthetics disrupt consciousness without at least acknowledging the fact that there is a hard problem that is, you know, I'm a neurophysiologist, I can record various aspects of brain activity. I can also record or uh, get animals to respond to stimuli and things of that nature. But the relationship between these two things is really poorly understood. And I will not really make any inroads towards trying to answer the hard problem. But what I will try to do is try to put some bounds on what kind of properties uh, should the brain have in order to give rise at least to the possibility of conscious experience. So in case you're not familiar, this is sort of at least my view of the hard problem. This is a very famous passage from Marcel Proust where he describes this very powerful uh, sensation that comes over him after tasting a madeleine. Madeleines are indeed delicious. Uh, but uh, if I was to record from Marcel's brain when he's having this experience, undoubtedly I would see something like this. I would just see some neurons that are coming on and off online in all sorts of complicated patterns. And you know, what are we to do with these kinds of very disparate data? Uh, experience on the one hand, activity on the other. Sort of the traditional approach, and this is what most uh, people do, uh, this has been articulated by Christoph Koch and Francis Crick amongst others, is try to at least find some correlates. That is, you know, maybe one particular cells fire, a person is having an experience. That's at least uh, sort of the first move towards trying to understand the relationship. And there's nothing wrong with this worldview. In fact, it's quite good and important. Uh, but I'm going to take a slightly different view here. It's in by no means antagonistic to the idea of having neural correlates of consciousness, but the view I am going to assume here, and this is not due to me, this is due to people like Andy Clark and Van Gelden and Randy Beer, etc. The idea is that we treat the brain as a part of a larger dynamical system that includes the brain, the body, and the environment. They interact with each other in uh, reciprocal and complicated ways. And the only reason I'm really bringing this up here is that in this worldview, we don't really insist on having a correlation. There's, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that when some particular neurons fire, one has a particular kind of experience. In fact, in this worldview, what uh, the state of the brain really encodes is how the brain will respond to a future perturbation. So uh, in the first part of this talk, I will try to tell you that while we believe that uh, this property that determines how the brain will respond to a future perturbation is stability. And I will show you some of our results on analysis of stability of brain dynamics in the unstimulated case, in the awake and the anesthetized state. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll tell you about some of our work on sensory responses, both in the awake brain and also under anesthesia. And while we can't quite rigorously connect these two uh, kinds of data, I hope you will see that there is a relationship, okay? But first, I just want to say a couple of words on what is dynamics anyways. This is sort of a word that gets thrown around, but uh, at least what I mean in this case is something quite simple. Say uh, I wanted to describe a motion of a pendulum, okay? It turns out that in order for me to model the pendulum to describe what it's going to do and predict what it's going to do, I need to have two pieces of information for the pendulum, its position and velocity. In other words, uh, any state of the pendulum can be a point in a plane spanned by position and velocity. So we call this state space. So having state space is the first ingredient to building successful models of dynamics. And uh, the second part that is essential is having laws of motions. They take in the state of the brain and they draw an arrow telling you how the state, where the state will be next. So for instance, if you do this for a pendulum, you would get a circle and that describes an oscillation of the pendulum. So this is all pretty well and good. Uh, uh, notice here that there is a, you can't see my pointer, but there is a thing called theta in there. And I'm gonna leave that vague a little bit for now, but what I mean to say is that these are parameters. You know, what kind of a pendulum is it? Is it swinging through uh, molasses? Is it, is it pushed by something? Things of that nature, okay? So this is the kind of understanding we seek of the brain, but there are a couple of huge problems. We don't know what makes up the state space of the brain. We don't even have an approximate model of the dynamics in the state space. So this might seem hopeless. 
but I hope to convince you that this is not quite so. And uh, we're going to use as motivation uh, results by Varela, but also by many others, that basically point to the fact that when we perceive a sensory stimulus, neurons in different parts of the brain become correlated. And these neurons don't have to be physically connected to each other. So let me illustrate one experiment that I happen to like quite well uh, that shows this kind of an effect. So Varela and company showed people these kinds of stimuli. I hope many of you can see that the top is a face, and probably most of you would see the bottom picture as just a collection of blobs, but it is actually the same exact picture. It's just turned upside down. So in this way, they were able to sort of control the nature of the stimulus, and this is related to what Dr. Larkin was saying, that the stimulus itself is not the same thing as the perception of the stimulus, but bias the perception to either be a meaningful perception of a face or just seeing some blobs, okay? And what they have observed is that when a person saw a face, uh, uh, different uh, signals from collected from different parts of their brain using EEG became synchronized, and that is what is shown by those uh, 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 lines that connect the various dots. And this synchrony is very transient. It emerges just for a few milliseconds after the stimulus, and then it uh, disappears. And it's not observed uh, when the person is looking at the image that they think is a collection of blobs. OK, so before we go on, I just want to show what exactly is meant by these arrows. And uh, specifically, in this case, they were interested in brain oscillations that one can record from the EEG. And uh, 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 you would connect these different oscillators if their phases are coupled. So for instance, if you looked on the left-hand side, you see two oscillations at more or less the same frequency, but they don't appear to be coherent. Sometimes the blue one is ahead, sometimes the red one is ahead. There is no clear pattern. And if you plot the phase angle between the two oscillators, you wouldn't get a peak in that histogram. It would be just random. In contrast, on the right, you can see that the phases of the two oscillations are quite coupled in that the red one typically precedes the green one. In this case, you get a peak in the histogram and you would connect these two dots. So that's what's kind of meant by connectivity in this uh, paper. So uh, in other words, what this shows is that perception of a stimulus is accompanied by this large scale involving large parts of the brain oscillatory activity that is transiently synchronized. Okay, so uh, uh, now we're in a position to then maybe ask, well, what kind of parameters, what kind of thetas could the dynamics have in order to allow the different pendula to synchronize? So you can imagine, for instance, that uh, my pendulum is swinging through molasses, right? So if I push such a pendulum, it will maybe swing once or twice, but then it will relax back to rest. So we call such systems stable. So if all oscillators in the brain were of this kind, then all perturbations would very quickly damp, and you would have no chance of forming this large-scale assembly. You can imagine uh, uh, the opposite case, and this would have happened if we didn't turn off the other microphone, is that uh, uh, any perturbation, uh, no matter how small, will grow without bound. We would call this system unstable, and maybe this is similar to what happens during the onset of seizures. But neither one of these extreme examples are really compatible with the formation of large-scale assemblies. So based on this very kind of simple-minded reasoning, we hypothesize that maybe the brain needs to control the stability of its dynamics to be between these two regimes, specifically at, at the point that we call critical, where oscillations neither explode nor immediately damp. So to first test this hypothesis, we used uh, uh, monkeys that were planted with electrodes covering the entire cortical surface. And you can see uh, uh, the map of the electrodes. And uh, uh, those squiggly lines to the right of those are the kinds of signals that we can record. And they're similar to EEG signals, but with some really advantageous features that I want to get into. So, uh, um, and what we did is we slid a tiny little window, about 300 milliseconds along the data, and fit it to a model. So as I alluded to earlier, we don't have a model of brain dynamics, but nevertheless, if you take a signal length small enough, perhaps a linear approximation will just do. And there, there, there are many ways to improve upon this, and some groups have done that, actually. So why did we do this? And that is because the kind of model that we fit precisely describes the spatiotemporal oscillations that, for instance, Varela and company have observed during sensory stimuli. Uh, 
And uh, I don't want to dwell on the mathematics here. It's pretty straightforward stuff. The important part here is that the damping, how stable or unstable the oscillations are, is controlled by this parameter lambda. Specifically, if lambda is less than 1, then oscillations damp. If lambda is greater than 1, that means oscillations explode. And if lambda is about 1, that is uh, uh, sort of the critical point. So in other words, if our hypothesis is worth the ink it's written with, we should expect to see eigenvalues close to 1 in the awake case. And that is indeed exactly what we have observed. Uh, this is an example of a recording. You can see that sort of the hot colors show where there were more lambdas, and you can see that they're found precisely near unity. A remarkable thing happens when you inject anesthetic. So you can see specifically that uh, uh, mostly critical uh, eigenvalues become more damped. In other words, uh, uh, and this happens in parallel uh, with loss of responsiveness. And I won't have uh, time to go over all these data, and all of this has been now published, that this is true in every kind of monkey. This is true uh, in humans who have been implanted with uh, these kinds of electrodes for epilepsy mapping. This is true for different kinds of anesthetics, drugs like ketamine, and also drugs like propofol, and I will say a bit more about this towards the end of the talk. Uh, uh, that's right. Uh, um, so what are the implications of this? As um, uh, somebody, I think, mentioned, awareness under anesthesia, it's very infrequent, but when it does happen, it's quite traumatic. So one obvious thing we would want to know is how reliable is measure of stability uh, for distinguishing between activity in the awake brain and activity in the anesthetized brain. Well, so to test uh, uh, the reliability of these ideas, we built a classifier and we fed it data that was processed in different ways from the same kinds of signals. And you can see, again, you can see my pointer. Maybe, can I do this? I can't, oh, no, I can't do that. Sorry about that. But anyways, uh, the blue line is the, uh, the, the, the classifier built on stability. And you can see that it is a lot better just than any other classifier that we have tested. Uh, uh, specifically, it's a lot better than looking just at the spectrum of signals. OK, that's the green curve. And uh, 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 another important fact about this is if you start messing with the signals a little bit, disrupting the phases, you disrupt the reli reliability of the classifier. And that's, that's the other colors here. So uh, at least one pragmatic implication of this is that while uh, this is a more reliable way to distinguish activity in the awake brain, from activity in the unconscious brain. But I think it has more interesting implications. Otherwise, this is an example of one of several really prominent papers by Marcello Massimini, uh, where they have given patients a transient magnetic pulse that disrupts brain activity and recorded the EEG. And what they have observed is that in the awake case, uh, the response to this perturbation is complex and it percolates across much of the brain. But when the person is naturally asleep, and they have also done this in the setting of anesthesia, and they have done this in the setting of brain injury, the response is uh, simplified. And in fact, this is exactly what one would expect if many critical uh, eigenmodes that are excitable in the awake brain become damped and are no longer recruited by the stimulus. Uh, Marcello and I have spoken about this many times and we meant to connect these two observations more rigorously. I think they are connected. There's every reason to believe they are, but we have not really uh, uh, yet uh, made this uh, rigorous, so I won't talk about it. So, you know, uh, I've, I think I ho hopefully I've showed you some data suggesting that large-scale assemblies of neuronal firing form during uh, perception of sensory stimuli. So it is of interest to ask, well, what are these patterns? It's, it's a good thing to know that they exist, but uh, what do they look like? And this is the kind of question that Aditi Agarwal, who was uh, my graduate student uh, until she defended recently, uh, wanted to address. And for this purpose, we used mice, which Aditi has implanted with electrodes. So um, these electrodes covered the surface of the cortex. So this is a, a map of the mouse brain. Uh, so it co co covers not the entirety of the cortex, but most of it. And in conjunction with these surface electrodes, she's also placed electrodes into the cortex of the kind that Dr. Larkham talked about. One of them in the visual cortex, and that's the red diamond, and another one is in the parietal cortex, which is an association cortex, and that's shown by the blue diamond. So what did she see? 
So in fact, uh, what she observed were oscillations, but we knew this from many, many other uh, works on the subject. So the red traces in both cases show oscillations observed in V1. And I hope you can see that they happen at two different frequencies. One is much faster, so-called gamma frequency happens between 30 and 50 hertz. The other one is between three and six hertz. And some people believe that this is an analog of the primate alpha oscillation, which is the most dominant rhythm of the EEG. So I sort of tentatively called it alpha star. But uh, the important part here is that these oscillations are not limited to just the visual cortex. You see them, for instance, in the posterior parietal cortex in both cases, and you can see those with blue traces. And I hope you can see that the oscillations at the two different cortical locations are not synchronous. One is phase-shifted version of the other. And I can make this uh, more quantitative by, as I've shown you earlier with these hypothetical signals, computing the phase angle uh, between the two signals. And you can see that in both cases, they have uh, uh, a pretty peak distribution of phase differences. And again, this is meant to remind you of the fact that in the mouse, we see nominally something similar to what Varela and uh, others have observed in humans. Okay, but now, because we have recordings from the brain itself, we can try to ask, well, what kind of pattern is formed by these different oscillations? And to begin to illustrate this, I'm gonna show you what happens along a strip of electrodes that go from the back of the mouse brain towards the front of the brain, okay? And this is uh, uh, the, the, all the different points uh, are arranged from the back to the front of the brain, and I'm showing you the gamma oscillation. So I hope uh, you can see that uh, the oscillations are phase shifted in a very stereotypical way. It looks like a wave that propagates from the back of the brain towards the front of the brain. If you know a lot about waves, you will see immediately that this is not exactly like a wave in a, you know, uh, in a pond because uh, the, cur the phase difference is not linear. It curves a little bit, okay? And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's wave-like. Uh, so now on the right, I'm showing you the same kind of data, but plotting uh, the slower oscillation, the three to six hertz wave. And you can see that there also looks like a traveling wave with one important difference. It propagates in the opposite direction. Okay, I also want you to see that they occur on very, very different time scales. And to make this a little bit more accurate, I wanna show you both of these waves superimposed upon each other. So there is sort of a forward ping and then sort of a much slower pond going back towards the back of the brain. But now we can, of course, make this general and study, uh, study the propagation of these waves along the entire surface of the brain. And as I've pointed out in the previous slide, it's not exactly linear. The path of the wave curves. You can see it curves towards the lateral side of the brain. But uh, nevertheless, the, uh, uh, along most points in the brain, the direction in which the gamma oscillation propagates is the opposite uh, from the slower three to six hertz oscillation. And now movies, because movies are cool. So this, uh, I'm gonna try to make this work. Yes, so this you will see is what the gamma wave looks like on the whole surface of the brain. Okay, you can see it has, it sort of looks like a traveling wave, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. So I'm just using the term wave a little bit loosely here. Okay, and now this is a slower wave. At zero, there will be stimulus, and you can see here it is much, much slower, and it sort of rotates around the brain like so, but in the opposite direction. Okay, all right. So for now, I've been uh, treating uh, uh, these waves as independent. There is the gamma wave, there is the three to six hertz wave, but they're not exactly independent. And to see that, we're just plotting you the same data, but on a longer time scale. So in the left, uh, in red is V1, and in the blue is the parietal cortex. So, uh, and I'm showing you also traces of the fast wave, the gamma wave on the top, and the slower wave, the, uh, the alpha wave, let's just say on the bottom. So uh, you can see that the gamma oscillation waxes and wanes. It gets bigger, then it gets smaller, it gets bigger, then it gets smaller. And this waxing and waning is connected to the phase of the slower oscillation. And that is true not just in V1, but it is also true in the PPA. And uh, in C, I'm showing you basically everywhere in the brain where there was statistically significant coupling between two oscillations. And again, this involves most of the brain, but the phase at which the gamma oscillation depends on the location. So 
now here is a connection, I think, to something really important that Dr. Larkham said, is that uh, the different signals that we can pick up in the EEG or the LFP are related to different biophysical sort of phenomena. The slower events, like the slow wave, is related to synaptic inputs. It could also be related to dendritic potentials. The faster oscillation, like the gamma oscillation, is typically connected to actual neuronal firing. So if the phase of the slower wave modulates the amplitude of the gamma wave, we figured maybe what we're seeing is an effect of neurons that are firing at the preferred phase of the slower oscillation. And because we have implanted electrodes into the, into the brain at different locations, we can study individual neurons. And here are a couple of examples of these. So uh, the bottom is the visual cortex, and towards the top is the parietal cortex. And the, the squiggly line below shows the slow oscillation. And I think you can see quite clearly that both neurons in these example cases um, fire at a prefers, preferred phase of the slow oscillation. The probability of firing is increased. And this was true for the absolute majority of most neurons that we have recorded. And in E and F, I'm showing you that although most neurons were entrained by the wave, the phase that they preferred to fire at depended on the neuron. So as the uh, as the slow wave goes through the visual cortex, different neurons, each one of them fires at a different phase along the wave. And now I want to sort of go full circle here and return back to this idea of different neurons becoming correlated after a sensory stimulus. So if different neurons in V1 and PPA are both phase locked to the same spatial temporal oscillation, that should imply that they should be phase locked to each other. And that's what we tested here. Okay, so on the left in G is what happens before the stimulus for all possible pairs of V1 and PPA neurons. And I hope you can see nothing here. If you see something here, maybe, uh, maybe that's an artifact. But th there is really nothing. It's just, it just looks random. But immediately after the stimulus, you can see by the sort of vertical stripe of the warmer color that the probability that a V1 neuron is increased, uh, fires, is increased around the time of uh, the spike of a PPA neuron. And this is for all possible pairs across all different layers of the cortex, et cetera. Okay, so um, this is what I've tried to tell you so far, and that is visual stimuli elicit two spatial temporal patterns that resemble propagating waves, that they occur at different frequencies and propagate in opposite directions. They percolate across much of the cortex, and they sort of coordinate firing of otherwise disconnected neurons uh, in different cortical regions. And here is another connection to uh, what uh, Professor Larkham told you, is that there is a fundamental difference between you know, processing of sensory stimuli and conscious detection of a stimulus. I could certainly record uh, neurons in the brain that will record to a stimulus that you will not see. For instance, neurons, and I will show you some of this at the very end, reliably respond to stimuli under anesthesia. Okay, so, uh, and uh, we cannot, like Varela, manipulate the meaning of the stimulus because these are mice, but we can nevertheless manipulate the strength of the stimulus to uh, modify whether the mouse can or cannot perceive it and study what happens to these different waves as we do that. Sorry. And this is a result from the awake mouse. Okay, we varied the stimulus intensity and studied the feed forward, the gamma wave, and the feedback. The, the slower wave as a function of stimulus intensity. So the top row shows nothing at all. The, the feed forward gamma oscillation is unaffected by the strength of the stimulus. It proceeds in more or less the same fashion. But what you see is that the spatial extent that is involved in this feedback oscillation grows dramatically as soon as we cross some uh, uh, stimulus intensity value. And uh, we're working on doing the behavioral experiments for this ourselves, but based on published work, the, st the threshold for sensory perception occurs precisely at the point where we see the booming of the uh, feedback wave. Okay, so now that we have identified an aspect of the response that seems to at least correlate with the possibility of sensory detection rather than processing, we're equipped to ask, well, what do anesthetics do to all of these things? And I think several people have alluded to this before, but I will say it again, is that anesthetics are different. They don't uh, 
work on the same molecular targets. They don't produce the same effect on the EEG. So for instance, some anesthetics like isoflurane and propofol cause slowing of the EEG, and I'm showing you just some examples. We've recorded this is not a new discovery. This has been known for a long time. Uh, ketamine, on the other hand, which is a very interesting drug for a number of reasons, doesn't seem to do that at all. It produces EEG patterns that are not, remarkably similar to those observed in the awake brain. Okay? So, uh, and you can take my word on this. I'm just running out of time. Uh, the feet forward wave was not really strongly affected by the presence of anesthetic. However, the feedback wave was just destroyed, okay? So the top row is the same data that you saw a couple of slides ago. Uh, uh, the bottom row is isoflurane and ketamine. I just want to point out Aditi's heroics. This is the same mouse, okay? So it is not a difference between mice, not a difference in how we've treated these mice. It is the same mouse recorded with the same electrode and the different anesthetic conditions, okay? So regardless of whether you use isoflurane or you use ketamine, the feedback wave is destroyed. And the major point I want to make is that the responses to stimuli in the anesthetized brain resemble uh, responses to subthreshold stimuli in the awake brain. And uh, finally, to put this all together, uh, you know, I've tried to argue that this feedback cortical wave uh, orchestrates, coordinates firing of otherwise disconnected neurons into different parts of the brain. So if the feedback wave is destroyed by anesthetics, so should the coordination in firing. And that is indeed the case. So what you can see is that when the slow wave is attenuated, uh, uh, neurons in the anesthetized brain, especially in the primary visual cortex that's shown in red, readily respond to a stimulus. There is no problem there. You know, Nobel Prizes have been won by studying uh, visual cortex in anesthetized animals. But there is no longer a correlation. If you look at the neurons in the PPA, they're unaffected by the stimulus at all. And therefore, they will not become coordinated with one another. So in conclusion, I want to just sort of tie this work to some of uh, other work that has been in the field. Uh, um, George has already received a well-deserved shout out, and uh, I will contribute to that. I think George and Ancho showing that uh, uh, feedback connectivity is selectively suppressed in the anesthetized brain, and furthermore, independently of the specific anesthetic use, was a very powerful discovery. And I think I am now only beginning to understand the significance now that we've started to ask, well, what happens with the sensory stimuli? So I think. All of this points to some unifying theme. And perhaps this loss of feedback connectivity is indeed mediated through the dendritic processes, as Dr. Larkin talked about. And another thing I want to make a connection, again, this is kind of remarkable that uh, Dr. Larkin used essentially the same uh, slides as, as I have as far as connections to previous work. And that is uh, work of Peter Rolfsman and Stan Dehane. I'm just using a figure from one of their recent papers where they've showed that uh, in order for a monkey to consciously report having seen a stimulus, uh, uh, there needs to be this what they call the uh, sort of a, an ignition type event, that this nonlinear event that causes neurons from different parts of the brain to sort of fire together. And while uh, our results with the feedback wave uh, shows that this is at least a plausible candidate for this nonlinear amplification event that can synchronize firing across different parts of the brain. So uh, basically, I hope uh, uh, this is basically the end of what I have to say. Uh, I hope I showed you some evidence that when we detect uh, a stimuli, especially meaningful stimuli, the neuronal, what happens in the brain is that different neurons that are not normally correlated become transiently correlated. But in order for this to happen, the dynamics in the brain cannot be too stable or unstable. They should be near this marginally stable regime. And indeed, uh, uh, there is some evidence, although again, our modeling approach could be much improved, that this is what happens in the awake brain, that the anesthetics selectively dampen uh, brain oscillations. And somewhat consistent, although again, we should make this more rigorous with this idea, uh, with the fact that cortical dynamics are critical, we can observe that simple, simple stimuli elicit complex interacting wave-like phenomena that percolate across the brain and uh, in train firing of individual neurons. And anesthetics selectively kill this feedback wave, disrupt the coordination, and in that make the responses to stimuli similar to those that are observed in the awake brain for subliminal or subthreshold stimuli.
I want to thank my lab. Uh, uh, most of this uh, work on uh, the mouse uh, stuff was done by Aditi. She, she was amazing, okay? She still is amazing. She's no longer a student. She was helped by Connor and two great undergrads that are currently working on uh, connecting this to behavioral experiments, Helen and Jennifer. I did not get a chance to talk about uh, the work of other students. Uh, I've had a, a, a long-standing collaboration with Marcelo Magnasco and Guillermo Secchi. Uh, with whom I worked on the stability analysis and long-standing collaboration with Max, who was a collaborator on the mouse uh, vision experiments. And my funding comes from the NIH. And uh, thank you very much. I promise not to veer into philosophy, so I'm going to let somebody else uh, like Carlo Rovelli do that for me. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was uh, another great presentation, and we almost seem to be arriving at a consensus uh, of work from George's lab and, uh, and uh, the speakers today. Uh, it's looking like feedback information block is a real good way to alter consciousness. Uh, what I'd like to do now is take questions from the audience, and if we could uh, form a line down the, uh, the center here for uh, anyone who has a question, and we'll just take them in the order that you line up. Uh, I have a, a question for uh, Alex. The three to six hertz range fits uh, nicely in the theta range rather than the alpha uh, range and it's long been known that gamma oscillations ride on the peaks of theta rhythms and this has been shown to be important for place cells, for memory, learning. I'm wondering why you call it um, alpha rhythms. Letters, uh, um, you know, um, it's a little bit slower than the theta, the three especially. Uh, it has a, the reason why people connected it to um, alpha is because of the layers of the cortex that are involved. Again, I, you know, I don't know if there is much mileage in, uh, in calling it the same as primate alpha, it's just, I set it to connect to people who are not used to thinking about rodents. Um, you know, um, it does peak at about, so if you look at where this waves occur, wave occurs, it peaks at about five hertz. We call it three to six. So that's a bit slower than theta, which is what, about eight hertz? No, you disagree with me? No, theta is typically microphone. Theta is typically you know, four to twelve hertz in rodents, right. Right. and it overlaps for sure. It yeah. overlaps. Uh, uh, correlates beautifully with movement, velocity of movement. You get higher sure. frequencies, etc. Um, well, let's get some questions from the audience before Stuart gets to ask his first question. I just want to put a plug in for him that there is a fourth theory of consciousness that wasn't mentioned today that involves uh, microtubules. And the dendrites that Dr. Uh, Larkham talked about are chock full of microtubules, as are all uh, parts of the cell. And they anchor things like NMDA receptors and GABA receptors to cluster them together where they need to be. So with that introduction, Stuart, have at it. How did you know what I was going to say? Uh, I, I might add that the microtubules in dendrites and cell bodies, but not in axons or any other cells, are interrupted and of mixed polarity. And that's still a mystery. We think it has something to do with interference patterns. But my question is actually for Dr. Larkham. I hope he's, he's still there or a comment. Uh, the, uh, uh, talking about the signaling between the uh, top of the apical dendrite and the cell, cell body, which is uh, 50 microns. Uh, years ago, uh, Christoph Koch and his group, I don't know if Christoph's here, he's the next speaker, uh, put electrodes, two electrodes in a pyramidal cell in culture. 
one in the cell body and one at the very top of the apical dendrite, and recorded what looked like noise, a lot of chaotic activity from inside the neuron. But when they compared the, t the noise from the top and the bottom, they were perfectly, well, not perfectly, but very, very highly correlated. So the noise, it wasn't really noise, or if it was noise, it was correlated noise, which reminds me of one of my old professors once saying, one man's noise is another man's lifetime. But could it be, and also, Anurban Bandyapadye, who'll be speaking tomorrow, has measured inside uh, neurons with special electrodes and found very high frequency stuff in the megahertz, gigahertz, and other electrical activity. So I'm wondering if the activity in side the neuron, presumably from the microtubules and other cytoskeletal element, is mediating this, this, uh, this communication signally between the apical, uh, the top of the apical dendrite and the, and the cell body. Do you have any comment on that, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm really open to that possibility. Um, and can I share a, another slide? Uh, can I, at this point, I don't know if it works. Let me see if it, I'll, uh, cause it's something that I think we might be... Um, it looks like you got it. Did I get it? Uh, let's see. Is it actually not displaying? Let me see. Oh, here we are. Um, so we've, we've, we've repeated this experiment that I was just showing in vitro. It's basically the same experiment. We put channel rhodopsin in the neurons and put light on the tufts and record from the, the cell bodies. But now we, we can do things like go back to patching dendrites and, and so on. Um, in, in the first instance, we put on a, an agonist for the, for the glutamate, metabotropic glutamate receptors. And we can, if you see the black line here, that's the control case now because presumably they're not activated. We're in a kind of semi-anesthetized state, at least from the point of view of the, the coupling of these neurons. And we can recouple these neurons by activating the metabotropic glutamate receptors. But now that means that we can do this whole thing under much more controlled biophysical conditions. And I actually think if you could make a suggestion as to how we can disrupt microtubules, we can actually now just easily test whether or not that this affects signaling from the top to the bottom of the neuron. And we could do that with noisy signals or with, with uh, anything we like at this point. So I, I guess no one thought to do that because it's, it's, uh, it's really all, this is a relatively trivial experiment. Uh, because it's all done with just flash of light on the on the tufts and a relatively simple recording from the cell body. I'll be in touch on that. And I just want to say thanks to all three speakers. This is a great session. Thank you, Stu. Uh, <laughs> Professor Larkham, uh, the easy experiment to do is to have coltracine in your patch pipette and patch on to the apical dendrite. Presumably, uh, over a relatively short period of time, 10, 20 minutes, the coltracine will disrupt the microtubules in that critical uh, region you've patched onto. And if you see changes then in the uh, uh, EPSP and uh, spiking coupling, um, that would, uh, would be a very interesting uh, result. Well, I mean, once we set that up, that can be done in an afternoon, then it's going to We'll get back to you on that. <laughs> All right. Next speaker, please. Thank you, everyone, for the amazing talks. I really enjoyed it. Um, this is not really my direct field of expertise, so I hope it's not a naive question, but um, trying to tie everything together, I really enjoyed recently the paper by uh, Womelsdorf, 2014, on the dynamic circuit motifs approach. I don't know if you're familiar with it where they described the PV plus interneuron and SOM interneuron uh, gating of information and in link with the, the ping model of pyramidal interneuron gamma in the cortex. That seems to describe really well those large scale dynamics modulated by the thalamocortical uh, loops uh, with layer four and et cetera. And I was wondering if one of you could comment on that, if that describes kind of all these different talks together uh, with the large scales potentially modulated by that, the feed forward feedback loops, if that makes sense. <laughs> Is that for me? Sure. <laughs> uh, sorry, there was a lot of reverb, so I don't. Is this uh, okay? So uh, uh, I, I couldn't understand everything you said just because of the reverb. I mean, 
Um, I'm, we're not yet at a point to connect it to specific cellular mechanisms. I could tell you that um, uh, the feed-forward wave in uh, V1, uh, and this is consistent with Peter Rolfsma's work and many others, it starts in layer four, which is the traditional input layer from a lateral geniculate nucleus, and then it sort of propagates in a chevron-type pattern to supra and infragranular layers. Now, consistent with what Dr. Larkin was saying, our slower wave, uh, uh, the feedback wave, seems to involve, um, at least according to current source density, layers two, three, and layer five. So uh, there is definitely a connection between these two phenomena, but I mean, at this point, all the cells we are recording currently are pyramidal cells, so to talk about specific interneurons, I'm sure it, it, it is connected to that, but we currently don't have any data. Does that sort of answer what you? Sure, yeah. And can I just quick have a quick question for Dr. Um, uh, Vanini? Is it? Yeah. Um, do we know how um, blue light affects the GABAergic and glutamergic, glutabergic uh, preoptic neurons, and how that relates to melatonin production uh, for sleep uh, during sleep? Blue light, or just light in general? Light. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, um, um, there's not so much known about that, uh, but um, there is a, a very nice paper um, from. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking the the, the name of the 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 authors, um, but um, it's from NIH, um, and uh, they found that. Um, there is a direct pathway from uh, the retina to uh, the, 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 the preoptic area, and that uh, exposure to, to light uh, modulates sleep wake states through that pathway. Mm. So that's the most accurate response I can give you okay. now. <laughs> uh, you. But uh, so far, um, th that's the, the, the only evidence of a direct pathway by which light can influence. Um, uh, the response of preoptic neurons, and um, those can then uh, alter sleep wake states or arousal states. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mike. Um, whoa. <laughs> My question is uh, relevant to all three of the talks there. It's kind of a two part, but uh, just a couple of months ago, I had a routine medical exam, and for the very first time, I had the pleasure of undergoing anesthesia. And I say pleasure because it was kind of fun. One moment, the saline's going in. The next moment, the nurse is saying, you can wake up now. I had no, nothing hypnagogic, hypnopompic, no, nothing that suggested sleep other than I was out, loss of consciousness. But also, I was dreaming a little bit. So one of my questions, broadly speaking, is when we talk about being asleep but still conscious because I'm dreaming, or let's say someone is awake but let's say in a sleepwalking state, so they're still sort of in a dream state, but my real question then when it comes to the feed forward feedback waves, uh, I know you're working, many of you are working with uh, rodents, so you maybe, I don't know if this involves speculation or you can control for this in your experiments, but when you're obliterating that feedback wave, are you also obliterating this, the, the sleep state? In which case, when I was dreaming, was it like maybe when I'm first going under and first waking up and then it's obliterated in between or? Is this the kind of thing you guys even think about, I presume? But uh, I'm, again, I just think that dreaming is sort of a confounding issue here that has to be controlled with, uh, that can, we can rely on reports from humans, but when we work with rodents, you know, how confident are you that you're just looking at a simple awake, asleep, versus something confounded by, let's say, a, a dreaming state? Thank you. Well, that's an excellent question, actually. Uh, REM sleep is very, very hard to study in mice. It's very brief. Um, and uh, we're actually, I'm quite interested in using uh, this kind of approach in human, uh, human uh, epilepsy patients who are implanted with electrodes using REM sleep. Now, if I'm allowed a little bit of poetic license that uh, well, ketamine is in some ways a lot more like REM sleep than it is like slow wave sleep. For one, it doesn't produce slow waves. For two, you know, really when somebody's anesthetized with ketamine, yeah, yeah they will not respond to you, 
but you talk to them uh, 10 minutes later and they will tell you that they had these crazy dreams and hallucinations and things of that nature. So um, there's a whole interesting subplot with our waves and ketamine and we're still analyzing data so like don't take this as, as the truth, we're still thinking about this. But actually it's not that there isn't a feedback wave on the ketamine, it's just it's unaffected by the stimulus. So we have lots of, way, lots of uh, neurons that are phase locked to this oscillation, but the stimulus doesn't seem to affect it. So it's, it's sort of consistent with the stability result, but very different from, say, our experiences with isoflurane when it's just not there. So, you, you, you know, uh, this whole idea of being conscious of something that you're not directly seeing, like a stimulus, that, that's super hard to study in the lab especially in a rodent. Even in a person, it's really, really hard. Some braver souls than I am have studied dreams in people. My graduate student really wants to do it, so I, g I guess we'll do it, but I, I can't say anything intelligent about that. Can I add something to that? Or maybe Giancarlo first. Giancarlo, do you want to say something first? Oh, just very briefly, I will throw in something um, <laughs> to make things more complicated. Um, that, um, there's also the possibility that none of that, that mentation, that dreaming occurs during any of those states that you mentioned, uh, but rather uh, when one wakes up uh, from uh, anesthesia, sleep, and so forth, and that uh, brief or um, condensed experience gets uh, quickly integrated and we interpret it as a, uh, as a dream. Um, so, like I said, this yeah, is not I, going I to solve agree. the yeah. problem. Or, yeah. <laughs> or no, I agree because I, I can't localize when that dreaming took place. It could have been right before. And that, you know, so I, I agree with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so, so um, yeah. Um, just, a, just a couple of points on that. But, um, the, one of the guys that we were working with, Jan Aru, that, that uh, helped us a lot on consciousness, also recently wrote a, um, a let's say, opinion piece on, on what dreaming might involve with relation to what we're finding with the, with the act, activation of the apical compartment of pyramidal neurons. And, and essentially, the overall picture is that um, what we think is that the, your model of the world is, is actually encompassed in, in the connections to the top compartment of the pyramidal neuron. This is, if you like, the embodiment of your expectations of, what, of how a cortical column should be firing and that the, that the feed-forward system uh, is, is basically giving you evidence um, for, for what might be in the outside world. And during sleep, this is disrupted. But, the, but the, uh, the, the apical compartment can come alive under different, um, different, in the different sleep stages. We actually looked at calcium in the dendritic compartment uh, in the different sleep stages. And interestingly, we found that it was, at least in rodents, there's, just during the transition from slow wave sleep to REM sleep, there's this huge increase in calcium, which suddenly decreases at the, as soon as the REM uh, stage starts. And the, the other question I think that's relevant now is to ask how, how, is, how are the neurons coupled? Because I think on the one hand, you could imagine that, that your, um, during sleep, your brain is kind of dancing around with different, uh, let's say, uh, models of what might be going on, which might, um, which might correspond to dreaming in some sense. And, and to the extent that you're conscious of that will be to the extent that, that it's actually coupling along the axis of the pyramidal neurons and perhaps also coupling to the, to the thalamus, which is another question um, that's open at the moment. So uh, these are ongoing experiments in our lab to, to try to find out in what sleep stages there, there's coupling. But the last thing I'd say is that um, we actually looked at the effects of the different anesthetics or some different anesthetics on the apical compartments of these neurons and ketamine was absolutely uh, divergent from all the other anesthetics so so we found that in this is now in in, in the dish in vitro um, if you put let's say uh, urethane or, or isoflurane uh, on on uh, these neurons in 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 uh, vitro and you, you ask the question what happens if i activate the the apical dendrite you get a reduced activation, essentially through these these anesthetics that are thought actually to work mostly through um, 
activation of in, or, or as an agonist for, for mostly GABA A receptors. But ketamine, which as, as somebody, I think Joe Carlo already said, well, it works on, um, it was thought to work through, through NMDA receptors by blocking NMDA receptors. We found that it, it enormously upregulated the, the dendritic compartment. So this is in a situation where there's no glutamate around. And so we're not really, we're not looking at the effects of NMDA receptors because it's basically that there's no activity in the slice. Um, but, but we can ask the question, how active are the dendritic compartments nevertheless? And we find that you get huge uh, calcium spikes, huge plateau potentials in the, in the distal dendrites, which may speak to what one, one kind of difference that you get with ketamine, because you also get sort of psychomimetic effects or, or hallucinogenic effects from ketamine, particularly in the, while, while a patient or a subject is waking up um, from the anesthesia. And it's also a recent experiment showed that ketamine, for whatever reason, also downregulates higher order thalamus. So you could imagine that on the one hand, the anesthetic effect comes from, let's say, the circuit effects that, that amongst other things, is decoupling the pyramidal neurons. But on the other hand, and particularly, presumably, at some some dose of ketamine that's not quite act or deactivating. The, 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 or, or uncoupling the pyramidal neurons, you've got an enormous upregulation of the dendritic compartment. And I think it's very likely that what's going on at that point is that you're super sensitive to, to your model, if you like, and any kind of activity that's feeding back onto the apical dendrites is now wreaking havoc and, and making you hallucinate things because your, your model is basically unconstrained by, by feed forward activity all of a sudden. It, it would very much fit with, with with the the dynamics, and it would also, I think, speak to the fact that although although the, all these act, these anaesthetics are having really different effects and, and targeting very different things, that one way or another, it's it's at least according to what we are finding and postulating that that one way or another they are all feeding into a disruption of the the apical axis um, of of the pyramidal neurons, and that seems to be key. And I think we're not the first people to point that out. I've seen. Stuart point that out in, in many lectures already, and and it may well be because of microtubules, because of because of inhibition of the, of the dendrites, or who knows. But but that seems to be a really key thing. And on the other hand, you could imagine that that the anaesthetics nevertheless have other interesting side effects. And ketamine seems to be one of the more interesting. Oh, thank you. That's fantastic. Appreciate Just it. Just to get back to your dreaming um, question. Sure. Um, it's important to realize that um, anesthesia is, uh, in people is never an on-off. All during procedure, surgery, whatever, it's waxing and waning. The dend dendritic connectivity is coming and going. And uh, it's hard to titrate to that perfect place where you're um, unconscious versus uh, dreaming versus aware. And uh, even at a steady state concentration of, say, isoflurane in mice, uh, you see this waxing and waning in the EEG. And uh, there's no really good explanation for that. I mean, theoretically, in a mouse that's in a steady state chamber with isoflurane, you would expect boom and then flat. But it's not. It's boom and like that. So it's probably during these uh, lightning phases when dreaming can occur. Thank you. Great. This is kind of a kind of a layperson question, and it has several parts. If we think of consciousness as your work, what about attention? Would the slow wave in a consciousness model versus a continuum model of consciousness as a discrete step comparator evaluation of where you are at every moment. Could the slow wave be the refresh moment in which the blanket term consciousness arises? And as a second part of this, what about narcolepsy as an induction for sleep uh, consciousness and or attention, and how does hypnosis work in? 
in analgesia and consciousness and attention. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so where do we start? So attention, consciousness are related phenomena. There are reasons to believe that they're not exactly the same. Uh, so uh, Bruce gave me a little bit of a hard time for calling this oscillation alpha, and I agree, like, okay, it's just a name. Uh, there is a reason why I did that. Well, I mean, I'm not the one claiming there's alpha that people have, is that there is a lot of work in primates showing how alpha oscillations in the visual system are related to attention. So I believe we're seeing a similar uh, thing uh, in mice, you know, but like obviously it's not consciousness in a very generic sense, like the mouse is not like nothing until we shine that light and then, oh, there is a light. Like, you know, it still feels like something to be mouse before the stimulus. So. It is more sort of detection of, of, of a stimulus that I think that's, that's a fair game uh, to describe it. And I think attention will definitely modulate these waves. We're working on trying to develop behavioral paradigms uh, that uh, probe attention in mice. It's not so straightforward. Narcolepsy. There is, uh, there is a way to produce narcolepsy in mice, and that involves killing or down-regulating arexin neurons, which are in hypothalamus. Giancarlo alluded to that. They do affect sensitivity to anesthetics in a very non-trivial way, but I, we have never really studied these mice physiologically. Did I miss something? I, I think I got... Hypnosis. Hypnosis. Oh, hypnosis. I have no idea, Giancarlo. <laughs> <laughs> no, me neither. I I, to be, uh, yes. uh, well, hypnosis is uh, one of several uh, stages towards anesthesia. You first lose uh, memory. You, amnesia is the first thing that's taken out by anesthetics at the lowest uh, doses. Then hypnosis, where you're like asleep but can still be aroused, and so there you're more likely to have moments of uh, cognitive awareness, obviously. And then as you add more and more anesthetic, you begin to uh, get global uncoupling of feedback. And, uh, and that's the state anesthesiologists want you at. Next question. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Larkum. I, was, I thought the question about sleep was really interesting, and I was wondering along that line if there's any evidence about these are, are sort of the coupling in other models of loss of consciousness, for example, um, fainting. You say fainting? Yeah, like loss of or like low um, cerebral perfusion, in which like uh, loss of consciousness is something like really fast. I was wondering if there's any, I, I don't know, like I was wondering if there's something that also could happen in other ways of losing consciousness, it's not just anesthesia. Right, I mean, it's a really good question. I, I, so, so far it's a really raw and fresh result to see this decoupling. I was kind of startled to see it in the first instance. Um, so we haven't tried anything else, but I guess fainting would be, I'm not quite sure how we would do, find, unless you know an animal model for fainting. But, it's difficult and, to find a model right. for that. And I guess another one that, that, you, that comes to mind is, is the kind of loss of consciousness that occurs when you get some well, blow to the head, some, some kind of yeah. uh, um, really uh, global change. I presume that these kinds of changes very much change something um, by physical, physiologically, um, that, that you, you presumably you're getting a, a a change in in the general state that could also be uh, something in in the extracellular um, milieu and so on that that very much could change coupling but but how we can uh, how we could it, probably looking at trauma would be a yeah an easier thing to do in in uh, in brain with this there are models for um for slow wave depression and so on uh, spreading depression in in uh, in, in slice models that, that mm. perhaps we could look at coupling in these. I'm not quite sure what we're doing in the case of fainting. 
I guess my question is more related to the fact that if you think that this decoupling is actually the substrate for these laws of consciousness, that should be something that appears in very different models that trigger this unconsciousness. Right, I think that's, that's right. That's what we're expecting. So I guess that we're, we're claiming that this is the bottleneck, that, that there's many different ways that you could, there are many different things that could induce loss of consciousness, but, but if, if this is the correct formulation of it, then they all lead one way or another to decoupling. Mm -hmm. And now it's the, the question whether we can actually prove that. Over and that really short question, I was wondering about the role of these inhibitory neurons in these layers and astrocytes, so you think that this also could affect the modulation of this decoupling? Yeah, and, and I, so one of, the, one of the exciting things I think about finding that we can recreate the situation in vitro is that we, are, we can now test basically these circuit elements like inhibition in the circuit and which particular inhibitory, inhibitory neurons are controlling the coupling and so on. And, and so we mean to do this now over the next few years. I'm afraid we're going to have to cut it off at this point. We're all out of time. Um, if you have further questions, feel free to uh, speak with the panelists um, in the hallway. Thank you all for attending. And stick around, we've got some really good uh, stuff coming up still.